Practice test one. IELTS practice listening test. You will hear four different recordings, and you will have to answer questions on what you hear. You will have time to read the instructions and questions, and you have time to check your work. All the recordings will be played once only. The test is in four parts. Write all your answers in the listening question booklet. At the end of the test, you will be given ten minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet. Now turn to part one in your question booklet. Part one. You will hear a conversation between a woman and an employee of a beach safety club. First, you have some time to look at questions one to four. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Now, listen carefully and answer questions one to four. Good morning. How can I help you? Oh, hi. Good morning. Well, I've recently moved back here from overseas, and I'd like to inquire about enrolling my children in the club. I hear you have a great program for kids. Yes, we do. Our kids' program is called the Beach Skippers Club, and it's for five to sixteen-year-olds. Sounds great. My two are in the age range. What do I need to do to enrol them? Well, let me get your name first. Okay, it's Celia Hanworth. Celia Hanworth. Okay. Are you a member of the club yourself? Yes, I am actually. I was working overseas in Germany. But I always kept up my own membership. I just have an associate membership. Great, that'll be easy then. Now, do you have your membership card with you?、Mm, yes, I've got it here. And the number is C H eight zero seven three eight nine nine one. I'll just look you up on the computer. Yes, C H eight zero seven three eight nine nine one. Celia Hanworth, here you are.、Uh, are you still at the same address? No, actually, we've moved. We're now at Unit Seven A, Number Eight Three Five, New Market Road, Bowen Harbour. Oh yeah, I know it. That's the new apartment building, isn't it? Number Eight Three Five, you said. Yes, I work at New Market Business Park, so it's very convenient. Yes, it must be. Now then, how many children would you like to enrol? Two, actually. I have a girl called Kim. She's six, and then there's my son Damien, who's twelve. Okay. Now, have you thought about the kind of membership you want?、Mm, looking at your leaflet here, I can see there's the social or the competition membership. Well, I think I should put them in for the social membership. I don't think they have enough experience for the competitions yet because they didn't get to the beach much in Germany. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions five to ten. Now listen and answer questions five to ten. 
Okay, now let's just get some background about their swimming level and other sports. Have they taken any lessons and won any badges for swimming and water safety? Yes, they're both what I would describe as competent swimmers. They've both taken the water safety course and Kim reached the intermediate level. She's very proud of that. She's only six after all. And Damien reached the advanced level and then he went on to the water survival course and reached level three in that. Hmm, great. Well, they should both be okay. They've got the basics at least. Now, have they had any experience of water sports generally? Any surfing or kayaking? Mm, They have done some sailing. They used to sail small boats on a lake in Germany. But it's not the same as the ocean, is it? No, it's different when the waves are a bit bigger and there are tides to contend with. Are they into any other sports? Yes, they both go to Athletics Club at Newton Park. Kim has won a few events in her age group, like the long jump and so on. Damien used to be quite good too, but he's been suffering a bit with asthma, so he hasn't done so well recently. Oh, poor thing. Yes, I was going to ask you about medical conditions. I'll just note that down. So, Damien, uh, what should I write? Mild? Chronic? Oh, it's just mild asthma, really. The swimming seems to help with it. Okay, that's everything. Oh, just one more thing. I assume English is spoken at home. We like to know if the kids have any other languages or cultures in their home life. Sure. Well, we use English mostly, but they both speak some Arabic as well, because my husband's from Lebanon, you know. Okay, got that. Well, that's all now. So you can bring them on Saturday 21st at 9 in the morning, and we'll do a quick check on their swimming ability. Oh, and you can fix up the fee then. It'll be $160 for both of them. Oh, actually, we can't come this Saturday. How about next Saturday? That's March 28th. Okay, great. I'll put you in for next Saturday. We'll look forward to meeting Damien and Kim. Thanks. They're so looking forward to it. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part two. Part 2. You will hear a man making a presentation to a school committee. First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Well, good evening everyone, and thanks for coming tonight. As you all know, I've been asked to report to local school committees on the new Graces Creek Activity Camp, which is in the final stages of construction as we speak. So let's first of all have a look at the sketch of the overall layout. I'll point out the major features and show you a few slides of the facilities as we go. Remember that some of them are a work in progress. 
Well, as you see, the site is roughly rectangular and uh, it's bordered on the south by Grace's Creek. This is a narrow and fairly slow-moving stream that's been cleaned up a lot in recent years, actually. Now, if you approach from the south, you cross Grace's Creek and turn right into the camp. So, coming from the north, you'll see a bus stop just before you get to the camp itself. From the main gate, the driveway turns immediately left around the edge of the camp. And while you're on the driveway, if you look right down the opposite end of the space, that's across the lake, you can see the student dormitory, the largest building on the site. Um, you'll see that there's a shared jogging and walking track which runs next to the driveway and in fact runs all around the perimeter of the camp next to the wall. Now, going back to the driveway, just before the drive turns right, there are a couple of tennis courts, but they're not quite ready for use yet. And in the corner there, opposite the tennis courts, is a basketball court. It seems to be more popular with the kids than tennis these days. OK, so the path turns left into the large rectangular space, which is the car park, obviously, with space for about 80 cars and up to five coaches. So coming back out of the car park, you can turn left onto the jogging track to walk around the student dormitory, and as you go, you pass a couple of small chalets on the right, which are the permanent staff houses. While we're on the topic of accommodation, there is also a guest hostel in the centre of the south side, that's directly overlooking the lake, and it's for business groups. The climbing wall is just to the left of it. The lake, by the way, is artificial, but it is just deep enough for kayak training and even windsurfing or paddleboarding. That small building on the edge of the lake is the boathouse for the storage of all the water sports equipment. Now, the stream can also be used for kayaking, and there's a small gate in the south wall leading out to it. It's a great spot for picnics too, so there's a picnic shelter just there. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. Um, there are a few facilities which were in the original plans but haven't so far made it into the final design phase. We do have one building next to the dormitory which we're a bit unsure how to proceed with. The favourite suggestion is a gym and pool, though frankly it's a bit optimistic given the cost of those facilities. The most likely outcome will be some kind of food outlet, because that could contribute towards the overall running costs, with another option being a conference room. The facility will, of course, be partly funded by visits from the general public during school terms, and we've already had some interest from training companies, who could use it for corporate events and retreats. That will contribute a lot to the upkeep and development, because council funding won't cover everything, though it does cover the bulk of the ongoing expenses. Well, the site might seem a little far from most of the schools in the council area, but I should just mention that one of the attractions of this location was the easy road access and proximity to transport hubs. But not only that, the nearby Parkdale Forest has some excellent walking tracks and mountain bike trails. If there's a drawback... I'd say it's the lack of convenient shopping facilities within walking distance. It's going to be a great addition to the facilities available to everyone in the area, and it's the end result of a long consultation process with schools and the public. Now, we haven't been able to do everything that we wanted, not particularly because of budget constraints, but more because of the extent to which we were limited by the existing structures from previous commercial use. But... 
We have listened to both the parents and the students who are going to use the facility. Now, I'm sure you'll have a lot of questions, so let's take a short break, and when we come back, we can open up the meeting for discussion. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part three. Part 3. You will hear a conversation between a professor and a researcher about road safety research. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 26. Well, thanks for coming in, Adam. It's nice to begin meeting some of the research team. Oh, Professor Wilcox, w welcome to the Institute for Road Safety. Oh, let's be a little less formal. You should all call me Jane, OK? Uh -huh. All right, then. Well, you know, my aim is to meet all the junior researchers and have you explain your research interests. Of course, I've read some of your reports, but you may not have written up everything you're doing just yet. So, you've been looking into accident causation and mobile phone use, is that correct? Yes, that's right. Um, I've been working with Jamila, and we think it's something we really have to get to grips with at the Institute, uh, because there hasn't been enough research on distraction and accident rates. And now that mobile devices are so common, I mean, even among older age groups, we felt it was worthy of study. Right. So how have you approached the issue? Well, we've done a survey of the literature, of course, and um, looked into some of the main research methods, as well as different approaches to controlling mobile device use while driving. Mm -hmm. uh, there seems to be some agreement that different research methods suit different kinds of research questions. So I'll explain some of our conclusions. One relatively new approach is to use uh, driving simulators, rather like a giant video game where drivers are put through a controlled driving course and their reactions are monitored. Now, this allows researchers to test out their assumptions uh, because they have complete control over the road conditions, of course, including weather and uh, other vehicles, Simulators allow perfectly timed interruptions from incoming mobile phone calls or um, instructions to send a text and so on. But the simulator machines are very expensive and uh, may not actually show reactions in real road conditions. OK. So then there have been one or two limited studies of real observed driving using special police cameras. Mm-hmm. Um, these are set up at specific road locations and drivers are secretly filmed as they pass the camera with the registration plate not visible for privacy reasons. So this approach is good for showing us how people use handheld phones in particular. Of course, if they're using hands-free connections, well, that may or may not be visible, so it isn't counted. Uh, the reason that this is limited is that obtaining the rights to see and use the video footage is a legal nightmare. 
but it does allow for the gathering of group statistics, such as gender or approximate age divisions. Mm. Well, then the next approach is based on survey questionnaires. These are a bit more well, traditional, of course. There is the usual issue around the fact that participation is voluntary, so you may get some bias in the statistics, but they are useful for surveying large numbers of drivers and quick data analysis. You can incorporate questions on a wider range of topics, of course. The last method we've looked into is um, small group research, or focus groups, I should say. That's relatively easy to set up, and the major point in its favour is how revealing it can be about drivers' attitudes. Not only to phone use, but to some of the measures proposed to try to control their behaviour with mobile devices. Uh, you can get into some detail there, although the analysis and transcription takes time, and one must be careful not to generalise. I mean, the findings are not hard data after all, but more qualitative, really. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. So, do you have any proposed directions for your own research? Mm, well, yes. For a while we were thinking of trying to put together a study of videos of observed driving in real conditions using the police cameras, as I mentioned. Um, and I, as I said, we did try to get access to the video footage, but access is so restricted that well, we abandoned that idea. Mm -hmm. Then there's the driving simulator at the National University, which generates a lot of data. Uh, we don't have the resources to purchase time on this machine to set up our own study, but we have reached an agreement with the Human Sciences Department at the National University. That's good. Yes, we're going to share one of their sets of data so we can do our own analysis. We're looking at a particular group of drivers and their eye movements um, immediately after they receive a mobile call. We, we hope to send in a couple of articles to major journals out of this one. Mm -hmm. Then we put together a questionnaire on attitudes of drivers, um, in particular on attitudes to measures designed to prevent mobile phone use, such as punishments, we considered a focus group on this, but in the end we felt that we needed the larger number of participants offered by a telephone survey. OK. Well, I'll have a look at your proposals on those ideas when I've settled in. I haven't worked much with telephone surveys myself, but I do know you have to be very careful how you identify yourself to the participants and be prepared to spend a lot of time making calls in order to get the numbers, more so than with postal surveys. Mm. And have you considered using live observers, making real-time traffic observations? Mm. I've heard that in Britain there's a research group using psychology students to sit at road intersections for short periods of time. They record their observations on computer tablets as drivers go through the lights, which is often a time when they start making a call. Hmm. Yeah, great idea. Thanks, Jane. I can see it's going to be very useful working with you. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turn to part four.
Part four. You will hear a talk about new materials based on spider silk. First, you have some time to look at questions thirty-one to forty. Now listen carefully and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Well, good morning, everyone, and thanks for inviting us today. As you know, I work as a senior materials researcher for FutureMat. My colleague Frank and I are here today to interest you in getting in at the beginning of an exciting new branch of material science: synthetic spider silk. You've all seen spider webs and spider thread. Or silk, as we call it. Now, some of you might not like spiders, but believe me, they all have their own technology, which we are only now beginning to understand. Now, you're here as investors. Well, we firmly believe that the production processes we're developing, based around the properties of spider silk, have the potential to revolutionize a number of industries. For example, textiles. Cosmetics, leisure equipment industries, and even some fields in automotive and aerospace. The interesting thing is that the multinational companies, even the household names you all know, have invested millions in trying to develop synthetic spider silk into commercial products, but basically have given up on it. So it's been left to the smaller startup companies like ours to continue the work. We may not have the resources to scale up to commercial products just yet, but we and a couple of our competitors have made some breakthroughs in the production processes, and we are sure that will interest the major companies in buying our patents. So let's get into some specifics. People have known for many years that weight for weight spider silk is incredibly strong and tough, which has led to all this interest by material scientists. Now, strong and tough are not the same thing, because we define strength as the weight a material can bear, while toughness is a measure of the energy it can absorb before it breaks. It may surprise you that some types of spider silk are five times stronger than steel. And you know those bulletproof vests that are worn by the riot police and security forces? They're made of Kevlar. Which is a tough man-made fiber. Well, spider silk is lighter, but could be three times as tough. It's important to note that real spider silk is a complex protein, but we now understand a lot about its amino acid structure. I won't bore you with the details, but it mainly consists of repeated glycine and alanine chains. Now. This protein structure gives it other interesting applications, which have excited medical companies, particularly producers of external wound dressings and patches, and that is because it has antimicrobial properties and is not rejected by human tissue. So infection rates can be reduced in accident victims. And Thinking far ahead, another medical application is in replacements for human tendons or ligaments. You know, as parts within artificial limbs or human joints, where flexibility is crucial. And finally, in construction, clearly there are a lot of uses for lighter, stronger cables linking machine parts, supporting or lifting items. So you're probably wondering how the silk is produced. You might think it could be taken from wild spiders themselves. So to give you an idea of how long that can take, a piece of fabric about three to four meters took 82 people over four years to create. And clearly, it won't be from farm spiders, 
These creatures are far too aggressive towards each other. They can't be kept in close proximity in large numbers. So the only way is to artificially produce the proteins in a kind of sticky liquid which can be made into very thin fibers. One approach to this has been to genetically modify goats, which then produce this silk in their milk. The protein content of the milk is about one or two grams per liter of milk. So you need a lot of it to get a quantity of protein. But it has been done. Although extracting the protein isn't really such a tricky process. Um, another approach has involved the genetic modification of an obvious candidate, the silkworm. But again, the quantities produced are insufficient. The resultant materials are very suitable for medical applications, though. These days, it seems, a more reliable and very importantly, scalable method is to directly modify bacteria, such as the E. coli bacterium, to produce the proteins in liquid form. There are a number of companies, and this is where we come in, working in this field. So we've shown you that it is indeed scalable. There are definitely some issues in going from raw proteins to usable silks, but the quantity is there. So now we've got the background, let's have a look at our proposals in more detail. Frank, could you start the video, please? That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to the answer sheet.